Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So welcome back. As we have seen uh, that uh, the objective of uh, this part of the course uh, was that we try to understand some combustion phenomena of practical interest in a kind of a realistic configurations of an engine in particular in an afterburner. So what we have done is that we have described the afterburner a little bit and uh, how it works and then we have been going on to discuss laser based diagnostics. Okay. So, at length we have discussed uh, about laser induced fluorescence which is one of the most prominent techniques to measure intermediate mass uh, species uh, mole fractions okay, in a given field and it has uh, especially with that because we want to know more and more about turbulent combustion. Uh, laser induced fluorescence has really helped in visualizing the flame location and the flame structure as such. Okay. Now, that is that basically goes into quantifying the concentration of intermediates like OH. You can also do uh, laser induced fluorescence of uh, alongside OH you can do with formaldehyde, you can do NOx, NO, uh, you can do uh, PLIF of uh, CH and so on and so forth. You can also do lift PLIF of uh, O atom etc. So, uh, PLIF you can really do of uh, many uh, uh, diff important intermediates and it has been a very important uh, laser based diagnostic technique that has been used by the combustion community to uh, basically uh, understand the flame location and understand and, and, and resolve the flame structure. Even people have used PLIF to understand how thick is the preheat zone and uh, how does the reaction zone structure looks like. Of course, you have to do PLIF of different intermediates and so on and so forth. So, PLIF is very important. But only PLIF is not enough because PLIF tells you about the concentration of the intermediate. You need to know how the flow field also looks like, okay. Especially if you are, uh, if you are working in a turbulent flow field, you would invariably need to know how the flow field looks like. And uh, the most important uh, non-intrusive uh, laser based diagnostic technique that has uh, emerged uh, as the uh, as one of the most important techniques in fluid mechanics for uh, for velocity measurements is something called particle image velocimetry. So we will go, we are going to discuss uh, particle image velocimetry here. Uh, we will not go into as elaborate details as that of PLIF. Uh, rather, we'll just give a very short introduction because this is a uh, this is more than the the technique is of course important, uh, but more than the physics of the technique, a large part of PIV goes into like data analysis. How you can get meaningful uh, results uh, out of a, a PIV uh, out of a PIV images or the or the mean scattering images. But I'll just give you the very basics here. Okay, so what do you do in PIV? PIV, as the name suggests, is particle image velocimetry. It involves particles. Okay. If you look into the fluids uh, surrounding, you cannot visualize, you cannot see, uh, measure the velocities, you cannot visualize the fluid. Okay. The air is transparent, you cannot uh, see air. right? So, to visualize that you need basically, first you need tracer particles. Okay. So, first thing you do is that for the flow field that we are going to measure, you put tracer particles in that and you basically shine light on that uh, tracer particles and this tracer particles basically scatter light and you capture that scattered light to know what are the locations of the tracer particles. Okay. So, suppose you get you, you so let us consider it like this, let us consider this uh, flow field that we have here, this uh, in this uh, say tunnel, in this wind tunnel or water tunnel, you uh, basically put uh, particles inside like this, but you could not see that because they are not scattering lights. So, then you basically take a laser, you shine light like this through a mirror, uh, so that it goes uh, vertically through this plane and then you can visualize the light the particles immediately because they are now scattering light. And then this suppose this is your interrogation window which is being captured by your camera okay. and uh, you basically uh, basically capture uh, this, this, uh, this image and you get an image of basically particles, particle positions or, or particles which are scattering light at their particular positions. Okay. So, what you do is that you take in a given after a given interval of time you take another such image. Okay. So, in one image suppose you have uh, particles 
scattered like this. In the next image which is taken after delta t, you get particles also scattered, but you see these particles because there is a flow in this direction, these particles must have moved in position in the in the corresponding same uh, 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 frame because the flow has advected them okay, uh, in some direction. Okay. So, then what you do is that in P i v you do not calculate the displacement of individual particles. So, what you do is that you break up this whole grid into several like parts. Each of these boxes may be like 32 cross 32 pixels, 64 cross 64 pixels, so on and so forth. And then you find out by cross correlation how much does on average how much does this set of particles inside a given box move in a given amount of time. Okay. So, for each particular box you get basically a displacement vector okay, delta s vector say and since you know how by after how much of amount of time you shine the laser. So, from delta s by delta t you can get the velocity vector. Okay. So, for each box you basically get a velocity vector by combining by finding out the displacement from these two images. So, that is what is being elucidated here. So, here you see that you shine the laser and you capture this uh, uh, image here at t time t and then you this uh, in the second uh, shot these particles have moved and then basically. So, this is say one of this this represents one of this box and uh, you basically then uh, find by cross correlation you find out how much does this set of particles on average move in this box okay? and that is your velocity vector. So, the most important thing is that P i v gives you the does not give you the velocity of individual particles it gives you the velocity field it gives you the velocity at these boxes or at these grids individual grids being of uh, given number of pixels some pixel cross some pixel okay, 32 cross 32 pixel is a standard thing that you typically do. Of course, now you see that this is basically a statistical uh, process by which you calculate you do not calculate the part velocity of a single particle you calculate the velocity of uh, at least say 10 to 12 particles inside a given box and there are numerous uh, guidelines by how what your delta t should be uh, like uh, your delta your, your, your displacement in this amount of time should be greater than 0.1 pixel and it should be less than like the window size by 4 typically those there are different such uh, guidelines and uh, one has to uh, know the guidelines to get reasonably good vectors. But the, the processing in PIV is very important as such the physics is just uh, here the light matter interaction is just scattering. So, you shine light and you get the particle images just like you the way you visualize smoke right. So, you shine light you visualize smoke and uh, if you take an image you will get a picture of the smokes. Of course, you do not get individual smoke particles here the target is to get at least you have to resolve these particles uh, uh, particles positions at that particular time because without that without you cannot obtain the velocity vector. So, it is uh, the, the physics of light matter interaction is not that complicated here like it is more involved in PLIF where it is like real uh, quantum mechanics is involved in uh, laser induced fluorescence. Yeah, there is nothing as such it is much more simple, but uh, the, the, the post processing is very very involved and you have to have um, very special um, post processing algorithms to extract these velocity vectors efficiently and correctly uh, from these uh, two sets of images that you get. And of course, uh, both PLIF and PIV can be obtained at high speeds and nowadays one can also obtain uh, this is in one plane actually uh, as you see that this light is uh, light sheet is made, but uh, if it is uh, more thickened a little bit this light sheet is thickened a little bit one can get uh, the third component of velocity also if you use two cameras something called stereo PIV. And uh, nowadays if you you can even do volumetric measurements uh, by using multiple cameras called tomographic PIV. So, uh, uh, flow field measurements are pretty advanced yet and, uh, and laser induced fluorescence have also been used to, to understand the species concentration fields as such. And so, uh, you have techniques on one hand to quantify the species uh, fields, you have techniques on one hand to essentially quantify the velocity fields. So, both using these two we can have a reasonably good understanding of how does the intermediate field looks like in a given given flow. All right. So, now we are in a in a good shape we know uh, how to use uh, how how what is laser induced fluorescence a little bit. 
of course, you see these are more involved techniques. It is like it takes years to, to master them. So, but this is just a very brief introduction. So, but you need to uh, you need to read more and we need to understand, we need to even do practical hands on uh, experiments to really understand, have a, have a solid control over these um, uh, techniques. Mm, uh, so, uh, both of we do in our lab and uh, uh, essentially uh, both PIV and PLIF we do in our lab and uh, these are workhorse techniques to essentially understand the uh, turbulent uh, flow, uh, 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 combu turbulent reacting flow that happens inside a, uh, inside a combustor. Okay. Now, let us go into the actual uh, problem at hand that is uh, the bluff body flame whose stabilization mechanism we are interested in. So, the we are interested in bluff body and swall stabilized flames if we just uh, discuss this a little bit. So, we have already got introduced to swall stabilized flames. So, you see that uh, both bluff body and swall stabilized flames are essentially ubiquitous in propulsion and land based power generation systems. We have already seen that in the primary zone of a more of a of a, an annular gas turbine uh, combustor, uh, in the main gas turbine combustor, they use swall flames. Okay, the reason people use swall flames is that you see the swalls as they dive as they as they create this bubble and the and the whole spray uh, the the sprays as well as the as the the spray cone angle as well as the flame cone angle also diverges. The resultant flame size is little bit compact. Okay. Uh, of course, it comes as a, at, a, at a price of a pressure loss, but it is this the flame is compact. So, as a result of that, the whole gas turbine combustor can be compact. Okay? Now, it is important to make it compact because the gas turbine combustors are very high pressure. So, you cannot have a high pressure vessel which is very big in size. It is more costly to and, and more difficult to uh, have a have a um, uh, have a designer or something like that. So, a gas turbine combustors are made co compact and of course, they are they are made of very high temperature resistant materials also. So, you cannot really uh, have a very big uh, combustor that is really not realistic. So, uh, we, it is imperative to have uh, gas turbine combustors compact and for that we use swall flames. On the other hand, uh, there is uh, we need uh, the particular ramjet and turbojet afterburners. Uh, the ramjet engines and the afterburners and even scramjets use bluff body or strut type flame holders. So, all these applications you give uh, flame uh, uh, bluff body type flame holders which we will come. Okay. So, the basic motivation between behind these behind using these either the bluff body or the swall type flame holder is essentially same. That is either the swall uh, type uh, the type uh, flame holders or the um, or the bluff body type flame holders both of them do the same thing in the sense that they create a local low velocity recirculating region okay that is they have a they create a recirculation region if you have a bluff body but the physical object itself creates a recirculation region downstream if you have a swirl, when the swirl number is pretty large, you see there is a, 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 a vortex bubble breakdown that happens, and that itself creates a recirculation region. So essentially, the requirement of both the both the bluff body as well as the swirl uh, 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 swirlers are essentially the same that they create a local recirculation region and local low velocity region. Why local low velocity region? Because once again, when you have a local low velocity regions, the flow time scales are large. When the flow time scales are large, then essentially you can this you can expect that the flow time scales exceed over the corresponding chemical time scales, and you can have complete chemical reactions uh, in a given uh, recirculating flow. Okay. That is the down color number is very large, and as you know that you to achieve a steady combustion, which is not prone to extinction and which can be easily ignited you need to have down colors number number down color numbers large. So, the basic motivation behind both using a, a bluff body flame holder or a swall flame or a solar basically is to essentially clear create this local low velocity regions and uh, 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 which has the increased flow residence time and also this local low velocity recirculation regions essentially recirculates bond products. Okay, so, when you have bond product recirculating, you can have this bond products come in contact uh, like physically or through diffusion, uh, uh, I mean both uh, 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 through advection or through diffusion come in contact with the fresh reactants and they can act as an ignition source to essentially sustain the uh, reactions in otherwise high speed flow. So, you uh, the, this is why you need uh, either one some kind of a flame stabilizer um, uh, to basically sustain reactions in high speed flows. So, now, now uh, the thing is that when this does not happen, okay, even despite the best intentions, 
in a, a downstream of a flame holder. Suppose when the flame is taking a, when the, when the aircraft is taking a sharp turn or it is like doing a sharp uh, climb, because of the very fast acceleration of the air inside the combustor, you can have flame blow off. Okay. So, like this kind of a situation. Okay. So, you see this SR 71 aircraft, by the way SR 71 is one of the best aircrafts manufactured or uh, created in the history of uh, mankind. So, uh, while this SR 71 is taking a sharp turn, you see this flame has blown off from this engine. And of course, you do not want a situation like this because and of course, you first of all you do not want a flame blow off like this and even if the flame blows off you need to have quick ignition because you do not because uh, if the flame blows out and you cannot have quick ignition then the essentially there is no power inside the engine. Okay? There is no uh, chemical to thermal energy conversion and then it can lead to a catastrophic failure of the whole aircraft. So, blow off we do not want blow off at all. Okay? So, blow off must be avoided. So, why so the question is that why does blow off happen in first place. Okay? Now, first uh, you need to understand that even if we create a bluff body flame holder, it is only within a certain range of conditions which is governed by interplay of fluid mechanics and kinetics one can stabilize a bluff body, one can stabilize a flame by, a, by using a bluff body. Okay? So, uh, though it is trivial enough to assume that if you lean out a flame that is as you go reduce to equivalence ratios from say 1 to 0 0.2, 0 0.9, 0 0.8 like that, at some point of time you have extinction the exact mechanism by which extinction happens in bluff body flames, bluff body stabilized flames has remained an unsolved works over a long time over 150 articles and uh, over the last 5 decades. But here what I am going to show you is some progress that has been made. Uh, we have uh, proposed a hypothesis by which and uh, with, uh, with the coupled with recent works we can uh, have a good solid understanding of. Uh, this uh, phenomena called flame blow off. But this is uh, you see this is very exciting right. This uh, image this uh, air aircraft is taking a sharp turn is, is uh, taking a turn like this and um, this uh, flame has blown off. So, why does this happen? How does this happen? Of course, you see you cannot understand this phenomena inside an engine because you do not have the diagnostics you cannot put a laser up in the sky to do measurements. Okay. So, what we need to do is that we need to recreate this engine type of con con conditions in the laboratory okay? and then we at different scales this first can be a very small setup and then you can have a more bigger like a prototypical combustor kind of setup and then you can apply this laser based diagnostics to measure the flow to measure the OH and using these combining these techniques one can try to understand why this sort of things happen. Okay? How does the flame blow off? Because you see the flame you will see the flame blow off happening for a propane air flame at about an equivalence ratio of 0 0.7, 0 0.65. Okay? But as the flammability limit is far lower 0 0.5. So, it is not only just the flammability limit not only just the kinetics that control the flame blow off it is some interaction with the fluid mechanics that cause the flame to blow off. Of course, kinetics has also a role to play, but in a typical flame that is what I am saying that because it involves the flow structure is so complicated, the flame structure is so complicated in a, in a given flame one needs to understand the holistically turbulence kinetics uh, flame structure transport many many things to know how does a mechanic how does a flame blow happens. So, that is what we are going to uh, talk now. So, how does a bluff body stabilized flame looks like? Okay? So, of course, we have seen that this is uh, definitely there is a bluff body stabilized flame. Uh, this, uh, this in an, uh, you have seen that in this, uh, if you go to this afterburner. Okay? So, uh, this, uh, these afterburners you have uh, essentially uh, um, you have uh, 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 this flame holders are essentially stabilizing this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, an afterburners, this bluff bodies will be stabilizing flames. So, bluff bodies are ubiquitous in afterburners in ramjets or in uh, scramjets where we use an aerodynamic shaped body which is not exactly a bluff body, but a, a strut type of flame holder. Okay? So, this type of blood is are common, but what happens when a flow approaches this kind of a body and what does the flame looks like and how does the flame change the flow. So, that we can do by using PIV particle image velocimetry in this. Uh, so, these are uh, pictures from my th PhD thesis actually. So, uh, you see that uh, here we have a uh, triangular flame holder and the flow is coming from right to left. Okay? 
and this is essentially a me scattering image this is that is this is the image of the particle scattering the uh, that is a laser light uh, scattered from the particles in one plane in the central in the in the mid plane of this uh, this thing so this is a you have a you have a basically a, 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 a cuboid like this and you have a flame holder like this okay so this is the typical shape uh, what you have and then the flow comes from uh, right to left and you see that just downstream if this flow if this is non reacting flow if this is an isothermal flow at room temperature you see this very beautiful von Karman vortex shedding structure this asymmetric structure okay why is asymmetric you have a vortex i here you have one i here you have one core here another one core here okay and then if you do a piv you will see this this beautiful uh, uh, sinusoidal structure where this different recirculation zone structures are formed so while it is non reacting the flow downstream of a bluff body is asymmetric in nature it is characterized by von Karman vortex shedding when the Reynolds number is greater than about 70 okay and this is this is essentially a manifestation of absolute instability okay there can be two types of instabilities absolute and convective so this is a manifestation of the absolute instability okay now when you have a flame stabilized along the shear layers okay but okay before that in here what you have is essentially you have uh, in the near field you have this uh, symmetric kelvin helmholtz vortex shedding and in the uh, in the in the far field okay you have this asymmetric von karman vortex shedding okay so this is kelvin helmholtz and this is von karman vortex shedding all right now when you have a flame okay as in an afterburner which is stabilized by a bluff body you see that this asymmetric structure is lost and you get a symmetric kind of a vortex shedding structure so you see that now this you have the vortex shedding along this okay this is once again the me scattering images so you here you only have kelvin helmholtz vortex shedding there is no von karman vortex shedding here so this is the first thing that when you have combustion the flow of course when you have combustion the density of the flow changes and that creates even a qualitative difference change in the flow structure the entire flow structure can be widely different okay and the frequencies everything can be very different so first of all this is the thing okay non reacting flow asymmetric reacting flow symmetric when it is downstream of a uh, bluff body you will see what happens when the in the transition regime when the reacting flow tends to become non reacting that is when the blow off is approaching very interesting features emerge so the effects of exothermicity that is the effect of heat release on this type of uh, flame on this type of uh, flows downstream of a bluff body is that the results indicate that uh, the turbulence intensities and vorticity magnitudes are substantially reduced in the combusting flows relative to the non reacting flows and it was found by Sotero and Gunin and these people Furby and Lofstrom was found that vorticity field strength was much weaker and less structured in the presence of combustion Fuji, Iguchi and Bill Turbine is noted that the turbulence levels in the reacting flow were much lower in the non reacting cases particularly in the vicinity of recirculation zone boundary why you see kinematic viscosity which is essentially the characteristic viscosity here is essentially uh, mu by rho so in combustion when your rho changes your kinematic viscosity essentially goes up okay so this kinematic viscosity results in greater viscous dissipation and as a result of which the velocity vorticity magnitude as well as the in, uh, turbulence intensities are much reduced but it's not so simple because uh, if you look into the vorticity transport equation this equation can be obtained by just taking the curl of the navier stokes equation uh, the density uh, 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 the density varying navier stokes equation and this is of course the left hand side the, the convective uh, the full material derivative of vorticity vector and the first term you have is a vortex stretching which is essentially the term responsible for turbulence 3d turbulence and uh, energy casket then you have gas expansion which is a negative term you see that when you have divergence of v not equal to 0 as you can have in in a, in a combustion then this acts as a sink for vorticity okay uh, typically and this is very interesting this baroclonic vorticity this is a positive sign 
term that when your grad P that is a pressure gradient and density gradient are misaligned, then this misalignment can cause some production of vorticity. Okay? And then this is the viscous diffusion term that, uh, that uh, uh, the viscosity essentially goes inside uh, this one and then the rho and uh, so when this when you have uh, uh, when you have essentially combustion then this term essentially becomes increasing. So, in kinematic gas viscosity the, the in term the in term 4 rapidly increases to the flame due to its large temperature sensitivity and this substantially enhances the rate of diffusion and damping of vorticity as has been emphasized by Coates. Okay? The term 3 is a baroclinic vorticity production which originates from the pressure and density gradient mismatch and term 2 is a dilatation okay, which also acts like a, a vorticity sink. All right. So, this is how the vorticity is not straightforward exactly how the uh, combustion acts because you can have some vorticity production and uh, people have think that uh, this can also lead to some kind of an instability because of vorticity production, but anyways we will not go into that. But as such the dominant effect is this one that when you have a combustion because the this mu new kinematic viscosity term increases uh, your viscous dissipation uh, of vorticity or, or the, the vorticity is dissipated uh, because of this viscous diffusion terms. Okay. Now, uh, what happens in the near blow off dynamics of blob body stabilized flames? So, many researchers have observed that uh, near blow off flames are highly unstable, unsteady and unstable and this goes back from the works of Zukowski and Williams and Nicholson. And Nicholson and Field uh, observed that large scale pulsations in rich blob body flames as they were blowing off. And uh, Thruston observed this large scale sinus oscillations of a flame near blow off, blow off. and um, Hertzbeck uh, showed measured the velocity fluctuations in a blow off body wake and he found that as blow off is approached this uh, amplitude of this narrow band oscillations increase. Okay. And uh, recent number of uh, recent works by, by Nair and Lewin and Keel et al have also uh, looked into this, uh, this dynamics and found that that as blow off is approached there is a tendency for the bay flame to become more and more sinus in shape and the vortex, sh vortex uh, shedding essentially shifts from this uh, symmetric vortex shedding to this asymmetric vortex shedding. Okay. So, this has been the uh, very, very brief literature review of what happens near uh, uh, the blow off dynamics of blob body stabilized flames. So, uh, what is the view on blow off? Why does blow off happen? So, Longwell said that uh, blow off is essentially an imbalance in the rate of entrainment of reactants. That is, if you consider this recirculation zone, so this is if we say that this is the recirculation zone. So, let us define the recirculation zone. So, the flow here you see that uh, this is the recirculation zone where the flow goes like this and it recirculates. Okay. So, say here this is the typically the recirculation zone of course, in the in the in the flame uh, this is uh, your, your recirculation zone size increases. So, we say that this is the recirculation zone when we represent it by R z recirculation zone okay. and here uh, this is the recirculation zone. Okay. So, he found that uh, that that he said that let us consider the reaction recirculation zone as a perfectly starred reactor. And uh, Longwell said that uh, blow off happens due to imbalance in the rate of entrainment of reactants. Okay. And uh, uh, Williams, Hortle, uh, this, uh, they said that uh, there is insufficient uh, uh, supply of heat release uh, to the uh, fresh gases. So, the fresh gases are not getting enough heat supply. Okay. Uh, whereas, the first one said that, that the rate of entrainment of reactants, so the amount of heat uh, released and the amount of heat uh, chemical enthalpy coming in, there is a somehow balance and there is a more loss term. So, that is why the flame blows off. Zukowski said that, that the insufficient contact time, so he considered that the, the, the hot products essentially acts as an ignition source to the fresh mixture and he said that uh, because when the flow speed is very high then the contact time between the fresh mixture and the shear layer may not be, uh, the contact time between the burnt hot burnt gases and the fresh mixture may not be large and uh, along the shear layers and as a result uh, it can flame can blow off. And uh, Yamaguchi said that it can be considered as an extinction of a strained flamelet. But none of these studies con connected the different stages of flame blow off that is they did not connect the early stage of flame blow off dynamics with the final blow off event and as a result the complete mechanism was lacking. So, we will go on to in the, ne in the next class we will go on to more contemporary works which uh, discusses how the blow off mechanism can be exactly understood. So, till then thank you.